The following reading is from Wilhelmus Abrockel's Christian's Reasonable Service. It is found in chapter 92 of volume 4. It is entitled, Concerning the Temptation Toward Atheism or the Denial of God's Existence. The just shall live by faith. Faith is that which renders spiritual life active. It is the most beneficial for a godly person. Unbelief, however, causes him most harm. Unbelief causes the internal corruptions of the heart to manifest themselves, gives the world a great advantage over him, makes him vulnerable for the attacks of the devil, hinders him in approaching unto God in prayer, robs him of all peace and inner rest, prevents all sanctification, is displeasing to God, and restrains the Lord from working within him. In one word, unbelief is the cancer of the soul and is a most wretched disposition. Since believers are at times in this condition, we shall therefore consider this disease in its harmful nature, so that everyone may be on guard against it and no one may yield to it. Furthermore, we shall endeavor to restore those who have become subject to this condition. We shall neither speak of the unbelief of the unconverted, nor of saving faith, nor of the feebleness and weakness always inherent in the faith of even the very best, nor of the short relapses during a given exercise of faith. Rather, we shall speak of the overwhelming and prevailing power of historical unbelief, which causes spiritual life to decay and brings it, so to speak, to the brink of death. The focus of this unbelief is either God the word of God, the spiritual state of the believer, the promises, or God's dealings with the believer. Subject. The temptation toward atheism is common. The temptation toward atheism is a more common tribulation for believers than one may think, especially for those who have been a keen intellect. For many, this is a concealed matter so that they do not clearly perceive it to be the case. Nevertheless, it is the cause of not gleaning much comfort and peace from faith. Others do indeed perceive it, but conceal it, being of the opinion that no one else is acquainted with such an abomination, and that everyone would despise them for such evil thoughts. Sometimes there are the sudden interjections. Is there indeed a God? Is there indeed a heaven or hell? Is my soul indeed immortal? Is all this nothing more than an illusion and imagination? Some immediately reject such interjections without them causing much harm. Others begin to reflect upon them, whereby this bent toward atheism increases, shoots forth deeper roots, becomes a torment, and becomes detrimental to religious exercise. Others are more oppressed by this and it becomes a prevailing disposition. False arguments against the existence of God present themselves. One cannot conclude that God exists. Prayer either begins to wane or lose its potency. Such thoughts immediately become an obstacle, and the faith residing in the heart cannot be exercised, nor is there any benefit derived from the hearing or the reading of the word. This is followed by great anxiety of heart grievous sorrow, fear, and trembling. This can be caused by the residual love of God in the heart, which cannot tolerate this. Or at other times, it can be in the response to the evil and abominableness of this sin, or due to the prospect of eternal damnation. Such a person will wrestle against this, but will not be able to overcome it. It has the upper hand. Indeed, the soul of some becomes so worn out and so despondent in this battle that it appears that they no longer resist such thoughts. Previously, there was still a desire to believe in some resistance. However, such a person is now succumbed, and his spiritual life is, so to speak, listless. This is not because he delights in this condition, but rather due to having become despondent and powerless. This can occasionally last for a long time yea, even for successive years. At times there can be periods of intermission, however. 
The soul may then occasionally receive some strength to turn those thoughts away, prevail in prayer, and receive some sweet comforts. It thus appears as if she has overcome. Such intermissions especially occur when we are engaged in instructing, exhorting, and comforting others. Yet this temptation has not passed, and such a person can readily succumb to it again. Sometimes such a person may gradually make some progress, but he will as yet be so weak that he does not dare to believe that such is the case. A sudden impulse and a falling into sin can cause the temptation to regain strength. Subject. The various causes for this wretched condition. There are various causes for this wretched condition. One, sometimes it pleases the Lord to try a person for a season by hiding himself and leaving him over to himself. Two, sometimes it is the consequence of an infrequent reading of God's word. Three, sometimes it is caused by a neglect of our scheduled devotions, a hasty observance of them, and a failure to acquaint ourselves with God. Four, sometimes it is caused by a yielding to sin, be it in our daily walk or when we sin expressly against our conscience, and thus done more boldly. Five, sometimes it is caused by our prayers not being answered. We may either be subject to a cross of exceptional magnitude or we may have a very strong desire for a given matter. We may pray earnestly and in a persevering manner take hold of the promises and yet not obtain the matter. This will engender despondency or a secret fretfulness. This can then be accompanied by the following thoughts. If there were a God, he would help me. I can see that it makes no difference whether I pray or not. 6. Sometimes it can be caused by yielding to an intellectual desire to penetrate too deeply into the matter of God's essence, His timeless eternity, His dimensionless infinity, as well as other of His perfections. Our intellect is too puny and the infinite God too exalted. If we occupy ourselves with reflecting upon God beyond what is permissible, we shall be as those who directly look into the sun and thereby immediately become blinded so that they are unable to see what they were previously able to see with clarity. If, however, we ins insist on comprehending the how of God's existence with our puny intellect, that is his eternity, omnipotence, infinity, etc., and we cannot do this, not being able to do this, this will beget bewilderment and doubt as to whether God does indeed exist and truly has such a nature. This then affords our heart the opportunity to proceed further and further in nurturing atheistic thoughts. 7. Sometimes this can be caused by an excessive desire for extraordinary revelations of God and a more feeling impression of His perfections, desiring this not only for our spiritual delight, but also being secretly desirous to know with more certainty that which He is. We are not then satisfied with the common way in which the Lord leads His children. Point 8. Sometimes the devil instigates this by way of sudden interjections, subtle delusions, or external circumstances. He may also do so by way of secret whisperings when he asks, Is it really true? Should such and such be the case? Unbelief, which is nestled in the heart, will then take hold, and such a person will begin to reflect upon these thoughts. Point 9. Sometimes we can come into such a condition by reading atheistic books, hearing atheistic lectures or argumentation, listening to the complaints of those who are in such a state, or by carelessly giving expression to our inner thoughts. Subject, Exhortations and Helpful Counsel Not only is such a condition grievous indeed, but it is also injurious to spiritual life. Everyone must therefore be very much on guard against situations and resist such thoughts immediately upon their arising. Here, fleeing is the best way toward victory. If one reflects upon such thoughts, 
wishing to rebut them with reason and to respond to the counter-arguments which present themselves, one will easily be captured and conquered. Therefore, resist everything, no matter how attractive and powerful the thought may be which is being interjected. And if you are already in such a condition, do your utmost to be delivered from it and attentively reflect upon the following matters. First, in all men, even in the most ignorant heathen, there is an acknowledgment of deity. Are you wiser than the entire world? Confirm this truth, therefore, in your own mind, even if it is all dark within and you have no strength. Secondly, most of the godly encounter this strife, especially those who are naturally endowed with a keen intellect. Should it therefore be a surprise to you that this also befalls you? Therefore do not lose courage, for the Lord has delivered all others from this strife and subsequently has caused them to increase in spiritual strength. The Lord will also deliver you, and you will become stronger as well. Thirdly, consider who they are, whose desire it is that there be no God, and who labor to deny his existence. This is the practice of ungodly men who do so in order that they might practice their ungodliness all the more confidently. However, you do not wish to be associated with such. You despise them. Thus, you manifest very clearly that you believe that there is a God. For if you did not believe that, you would not be disturbed upon hearing that they deny God and speak evil of him. You would then be pleased with them they being of one sentiment with you. Fourthly, consider your own heart for a moment. Is not your heart troubled when you are thus tried and when such unbelieving thoughts arise in you? Is it not your wholehearted desire to be delivered from this and to serve God in faith? This clearly proves that you believe that God exists, for otherwise you would be satisfied and you would deem yourself happy to have been delivered from such prejudices. Fifthly, can it be harmful to confirm that God exists? You know that the denial of God's existence can be detrimental and that a man can perish in consequence thereof. You know that believing this cannot harm you, but would engender and stimulate peace within, thus enabling you to serve the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Final points. Point one, therefore by renewal, Engage yourself in the task of seeking after and serving God. Presuppose the existence of God, even if you are not fully convinced within, and say, I shall blindly make the word of God my foundation for doing so. Obligate myself to believe all that this word says and do what this word prescribes. Point two. You are thus to start from the beginning. Neither reach out for lofty matters nor exert your intellect and mental faculties. Rather, stay with the word, read it, and in reliance upon that word, flee to the Lord Jesus a surety and receive him. Do not strain yourself to get a view of him, however, for that would be counterproductive. Rather, do so humbly, and so to speak, with closed eyes. Rely upon him because the word enjoins you to do so, promising that those who put their trust in him will not be ashamed. Likewise, humbly pray and hear the word. Refrain from that which is forbidden and perform that which is commanded. I assure you that if you thus begin to engage yourself, the Lord will gradually restore you, even though unbelieving thoughts may initially assault you vehemently, and even though you may for some time engage yourself without finding delight and sweetness in doing so. Point three, keep your condition concealed from others, be it that they are unconverted, beginners in grace, or weak Christians, and especially from those of whom you notice that they are also under assault. Rather than being of mutual help to each other, you would cast each other down. Instead, go to an experienced minister or another godly person who is strong in faith and reveal your condition to him. Do not contradict him, however, but listen attentively to what he has to say to you and consider quietly whether it pleases the Lord to apply these words to your heart. 
If not, then upon your return use the means by renewal, which the Lord has instituted in his word, doing so quietly and without much ado, neither by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord you will be restored. This has been a reading from Wilhelmus Abrockel's The Christian Reasonable Service. It is found in Volume 4 in Chapter 92 concerning the temptation toward atheism.